Well, it's another happy day at the Uncle Doug headquarters uh, where using Patreon and PayPal contributions, I bought a really nice old amp on eBay and it's time now to open it up and see what we got. As you see, Jack is performing his ritual CAT scan and things are looking pretty positive so far. Okay, the box is open and here we see the top of the amp with a beautiful original handle and like a crocodile grain. This is the original covering, part of the reason why I bought this amp. Let's get it out of here and take a look at it. And here it is in all its glory, a completely original Magnetone Varsity amp with the Magnetone uh, metal label at the bottom and the decal or uh, imprinted brand name at the top completely original uh, covering and completely original chassis beautifully packaged I can't wait to get this out in the workshop get it all unpacked and check it out so if that sounds interesting uh, then stay tuned and we're gonna do that meanwhile Jack is just sniffing his brains out here what do you think Jack is that power transformer good? Hey, it's got the Underwriter Laboratory seal of approval. It must be. Wow, check out this Magna Electronics Company metal badge with the snazzy little Art Deco stair steps on either corner up here. And this absolutely flawless and gorgeous original grill cloth. Not to mention the alligator or crocodile skin covering which with a few little tiny flaws is virtually perfect even nice rubber feet Doug. my god it's wonderful oh and there's a metal tag under here okay four beautiful feet and check this out the little serial number tag magnetone number 7900 they don't come any more original and complete than this, I don't think. Meanwhile, Jack's having fun in the packing material. Jack, are you in there? No. Well, here it is out in the workshop. And I know it might sound corny or somewhat inexplicable. But I get as excited about really nice, original, even rather low uh, value and unsophisticated amps as I do about the really high dollar ones. Okay, when they're this nice and this original, I just can't help but uh, just get uh, really thrilled with the opportunity to work on them. And before we get started, let's take a few moments here to review the history of this amplifier. I think a lot of us know that Magnetone began back in the 30s with a fellow named Dickerson who built a steel guitar and amplifier for his daughter and then went on to make more steel guitars and amplifiers and as companies do uh, Dickerson's changed hands uh, a couple times and ended up in the hands of a, a fellow named Art Duhamel in 1946 and he changed the name to Magnetone or Magna Electronics the headquarters was on Jefferson Boulevard in Los Angeles uh, and it's during that period of time that this amp was probably built. First off, it's very rare to ever find an original handle on one of these. You know it's original because you can see right here that the rivets are still in place and there's no way in heck that you could get this big end through this uh, little bracket. Okay, so uh, it's just absolutely in great shape. I, I've seen them, you know, torn in half and shredded and everything. And this one uh, is looks like it's a year or two old. As does the top of the amp. There's a couple little minor discolorations, but no cigarette butts, battery acid, or chainsaw scars. Thank heavens. Obviously, this one was never used by Keith Richard. Okay, uh, also let's take a look here. We've got our Magnetone. I think it's a decal. Okay, I, I thought it might be branded into the leather, but no. 
Uh, it's a decal that is very fragile and still in great shape, as is the grill cloth, which is astounding. Not even the tiniest little run or hole. And at the bottom, uh, the Magna Electronics Company, Los Angeles, uh, California. I don't think I've ever seen one of these plaques still be intact and in place and in perfect shape. The rubber feet are still here and perfect as well as the little uh, 7900 serial number plate. Now I'm, a not, I'm not aware of any sites that have uh, magnetone serial numbers uh, and they probably didn't even keep records back then. But anyway, this, uh, if you have one of these, uh, you could tell its age relative to this one, I guess, by the serial number. The upper back door is still in place with original brass oval head screws. And the chassis is a bit grubby and stained. Actually sort of out of character for the really good condition of the cabinet. Uh, which makes me think maybe moisture uh, might have been involved or something but once again when you have a cabinet that's pristine and you see this type of discoloration on your chassis it does make you wonder we'll see more when we get this out and take a look I have not touched this amp uh, you will see everything for the first time just like I am well a whole bunch of that grime washed right off of the chassis uh, I'm using a new product here. It was recommended by a viewer, Car Guys Premium Super Cleaner, and it didn't seem to affect the silk screened uh, paint here at all, uh, but it did take off all sorts of grime and grubbiness. All right, we can see here it's really cute. Uh, I'm going to wax this, which will make it a little shinier, but we have our two instrument inputs. We see Magna Electronics Company, Los Angeles, California. Magnetone with the musical notes. We've got the on-off volume control uh, pot here without the chicken head knob. Got our little Varsity logo. The all-important Underwriter Laboratory sticker, which I was careful not to damage. Uh, and then our model number M197-3-V. It's always nice that Magnetone very uh, fully labels their products. It makes it a lot easier to identify them. To those of you who see this, you know darn well that it's not a 50 watt amp. This has to do with the current requirements of the circuit, not the uh, power production. Okay, so uh, let's pull the uh, chassis out of the cabinet and continue our cleaning and waxing here at the top of the chassis and check out our tubes and our electrodynamic speaker. We'll now look at how glossy that formerly grubby old control panel looks uh, with the help of a little Meguiar's Gold Class liquid wax. Okay, I find that the liquid wax is really a little more gentle than paste wax, but uh, look how that turned out. I'm really pleased with it. Let's uh, pull the chassis now, see what, what uh, the rest of it looks like. I was wondering why it was so hard to get the original screws out of the chassis. Uh, and then I finally got one out and I realized, my God, they didn't skimp, did they, on screw size? There must have been a spate of a chassis theft back, back in Los Angeles, back in the late 40s. And they thought, well, we're going to make those guys work if they're going to steal a chassis from this amp. Apparently, thieves of back doors were nowhere near as rampant as those of chassis because the back door screws look like about the size you'd expect. Well, after soaking my calluses for a while, uh, after removing all the screws, uh, it's time to remove the back door for the first time. Let's see if there's anything to be seen. Oh, my Lord. Oh, that little rascal, I guess he must have put this in there while he was sniffing. Well, after soaking my calluses for an hour or two after uh, removing uh, these screws from the chassis, uh, we got the back door off. We can get a clearer view of what's going on in here. We can see the underwriter approved um, spider webs up in the top. Hopefully no brown recluses. Uh, now it's time to 
disconnect the speaker so that it can come out with the chassis. As most of you know, it's generally better to remove electrodynamic speakers in tandem with the chassis because it's very difficult to disconnect the four wires that, uh, that umbilical that uh, connects the two together. Okay, so I'm going to lay it down and remove the nuts from the speaker and then we'll be ready to do the mass extraction. Oh, may God have mercy on me. Look here, there's two more of those 9-inch uh, wood screws holding this chassis in. So uh, I'm going to set down the camera, grit my teeth, and get those babies out too. Good Lord, even the screw that holds the little strain relief clip in the wall of the cabinet is one of those massive screws. Nah, I'm just funning with you. It's this little one here. Well, I finally got the last chassis screw out, and I also removed the tubes uh, to facilitate the extraction of the electrodynamic speaker. So let's take a look at the tubes, okay? I think we'll find them very interesting. First off, they're all matching RCAs, which would lead me to believe that they may be the original tubes. Of course, I'm always going to opt for uh, complete originality whenever something like this, this coincidence, uh, allows me to do so. Well, the preamp tube is a 6SJ7, which is a pentode, so that should give us a really nice little initial boost for our input signal. Second tube, I think you can predict, is going to be a 6V6. Uh, a little bit soiled, we'll need to clean it up. And last but not least, of course, the uh, very traditional 5Y3 rectifier. I'm still having some curiosity about what sort of god-awful uh, soiling forces could have entered horizontally through the back of the amplifier cabinet without touching the cabinet itself. I mean, these tubes look like, you know, they were left laying out in the gutter somewhere for like two years. Uh, and then the cabinet looks like it's about two days old. I don't know, one of those mysteries, I guess, that we'll never get to the bottom of. Well, using a crowbar and some C4, I was able to get the electrodynamic speaker uh, out of the cabinet. Uh, and it looks like it's in great shape, thank God, because um, this would be no fun to recone. I've got it laying down here. I also notice uh, the coiled up power cord is in a matching reptile skin a motif right through here, uh, which I thought was very tasteful. Now looking in the bottom, uh, I'm going to assume that this amp must have been sitting next to a silver tone amp because there appears to be uh, a few droppings and some fur back uh, here. It must have been a cozy little nest, uh, kind of a like a crash pad or something uh, for uh, mice back in the good old days. It's kind of interesting that the cleats and the uh, chassis mounts are just plain, unfinished, uh, bare wood that are nailed and probably glued, I hope, in place. Uh, nothing fancy there. Sort of like after they got uh, finished covering the cabinet with the reptile skin, they said, oh, geez, you know, this is taking longer than I thought. We'll just nail in some cleats. But since they're original, I love them. Well, after receiving city, county, and state permits for the release of mouse dander into the atmosphere, I was able to blow out and cleanse the interior of the cabinet. Well, after removing more fur than a petting zoo from the cabinet, I have set it aside so we can focus our attention on the chassis, and speaker. And I think looking at the top of the chassis and the fur in the cabinet explains uh, why uh, the uh, depredations here were uh, restricted to the chassis itself and not to the cabinet uh, because I believe uh, it was a mouse nest. So uh, time now to clean up all the biological residues that were left by our furry little predecessors. And there, as if by magic, is the cleaned and waxed chassis. 
Notice even the transformer shined up nicely. It's got a nice gloss to it. And most importantly, when you use car wax on paint like this, you're sealing the paint and protecting it uh, for the future. Put in a new uh, chicken head knob. So it looks like, at least cosmetic-wise, we're in really good shape. And the speaker uh, looks that way too. And uh, once I flip it over, amidst a few tufts of fur, we see that all of the original capacitors are still in place and that the chassis does not appear to have been uh, molested in any way other than by mice. Now, as we know from experience, uh, the Sangamo caps are not the most reliable. Uh, so I think it best to replace them as well as the electrolytic uh, capacitors used for filtering and for cathode bypassing. So let's get started. You know, as I look at all the mouse fur and residue, I think back to how Jack was reacting to this amp when I first un uh, unpacked it. And if you remember, he was sniffing his brains out over this thing, and I bet you he was picking up on the mouse smell probably looking for some mice to play with. Time to review the changes that have been made in the circuit. The 16 by 16 microfarad electrolytic filter cap has been replaced with two 22 microfarad caps. The 25 at 50 volt uh, cathode bypass cap has been replaced with a new one of uh, equal value. The death capacitor has been removed and three Sangamo caps have been replaced including the coupling capacitor between the preamp and output tubes. Also a three wire power cord has been installed and properly wired to go through the switch, the fuse and then to the primary of the power transformer. The white wire goes directly to the other primary lead. Uh, the green wire is securely soldered and connected to the chassis ground. And also something you really need to always check is I looked at the value of the fuse that had been installed. It was 15 amps. Okay, so God knows why that was done. Uh, but I put in a one and a half amp fuse, which is very conservative, but should really protect this circuit. Now with the tubes all cleaned and polished and installed on the nice uh, shiny uh, chassis. We're ready to test the amp. Uh, I'm going to use the signal generator input to make sure that it's functional and then we're going to uh, install the chassis and speaker back in the cabinet. Okay, let's turn up the volume so we can hear the signal generator. Run it through some different frequencies. Notice also that the volume control is dead quiet because I cleaned it as well as the tube sockets. Okay, let's turn it down. We'll plug it into the second input. Let's make sure that one works. Seems like it's lower gain. One way to find that out. Okay, so it looks like they both work. This would be the higher gain input, lower gain input. That's about it. I think now it's time to install the chassis and the speaker back in the cabinet. One more thing before we reinstall the chassis is you need to double check the contacts on your input jacks. Make sure that they snap tightly into that indentation there on the jack to hold it in place and make good contact. Uh, the other thing uh, I also am going to check just for fun will be the cathode uh, biasing of the uh, 6v6 tube. I measured the cathode bias resistance. Uh, it was a 250 uh, ohm resistor and miraculously it's right on the money, 251.7 and the voltage drop across that resistor is going to be let's say 15.96 volts DC. Let me write that down here. And the plate voltage as measured from plate to cathode is 338 volts DC. Okay, this is a good example of why you need to check these things. Don't take anything for granted. This seemed like a low 
cathode bias resistor to me. I should think it would be more like 350 or 400. But look at the plate current. 63.4 milliamps, about double what it ought to be for a plate dissipation of 21.4 watts. Talk about a plate scorching bias here. Okay, so I think it's time that we start installing a proper uh, bias resistor and get this number down to a tolerable level. And to make this process easier, I'm going to use a resistance substitution box that a very generous viewer sent to me a couple months ago. Uh, I've linked it into the circuit uh, in place of that bias resistor and I can dial in various resistance values until I get one that has an appropriate voltage drop and therefore an appropriate plate current and plate dissipation value. Now, these are the results. Remember we started off with a 251.7. I went to 477 ohms and it's still uh, the plate current is way too high. 670 it's still too high, but it is getting down into a more normal range. 726 ohms. You notice how it's starting to taper off uh, here. And finally, um, at 1013, it came out a little bit high at 29 milliamps, but uh, with 1167 ohms of bias resistance, uh, I ended up with a a drop of 31.5 volts for 27 milliamps. The plate current, uh, I mean the plate voltage of course went up when the current went down so it's now 408 volts for a final plate dissipation of exactly 11 watts. Now two observations. Number one, I have no idea why all of a sudden the 6V6 suddenly required about four times the uh, cathode resistance uh, to achieve a proper bias. Okay, I don't understand that unless somebody put in the 250 ohm uh, resistor by mistake. Okay, the other thing is this makes me want to run in the house and grab every single-ended little cathode uh, biased amp that I own and start checking this because if it can be off this much in this this pristine original amp, what in God's name could it be off in kind of an old uh, beat up amp. Well, couldn't be much worse than this. Okay, so I think we've learned a couple things from this. Also, I should add that it's not the tube. Okay, I put in a brand new, an NOS uh, RCA 6V6 and it actually had higher plate current than this. So, uh, something really strange happened here and we'll probably never figure it out. So, I guess it's time to move on. Well, a nice shiny chassis has been reinstalled in the cabinet along with the electrodynamic speaker. The new power cord comes up to the strain relief and now it's time to reinstall the upper back door. Well, the amp is all reassembled here and ready to be tested. Uh, the parts that were removed will stay in a little sack uh, with it. Uh, not the cord though, this is a mess and it doesn't look like the original plug anyway, so we'll file it in the trash. Uh, but anyway, now it's time to turn it around and uh, drag out a guitar and see how it sounds. While the chassis was out of the cabinet, I took advantage of that opportunity to use this Car Guys Super Cleaner on the cabinet. And I don't know if you remember, but it was just a dull, dirty brown. And it came out this really pretty kind of golden uh, alligator Hide. I think it looks about nine times better now and look at the filth that came off of the cabinet. Pretty disgusting, eh? So I really have to give my recommendation to this product for cleaning uh, Tolex and Leatherette and other amplifier uh, covering materials. I haven't yet done the rear of the cabinet so you can see the difference between those beautiful golden alligator finish on the top and sides and the really dull dirty uh, finish on the back of the cabinet. And here is the back cleaned up to match the top and sides. Quite a difference. Okay, I think I got this stuff on Amazon. It was recommended by a viewer and I'm sure you can buy some if you want it there. Okay, tell them I... If you're wondering about Casey and Jack 
they're lounging out here on the back porch. Jack has his special ladder seat so he can look outside and survey his domain. Casey, however, just lays on her nice uh, comfortable cushion and sleeps, dreaming of her next meal. Hey, Casey. Well, now it's time for the acid test for the Mighty Magnetone. Uh, we're out in the workshop set up here uh, with the guitar input and uh, the volume set at 5. So let's see how it sounds. And I think it's worth noting before we start that although the amp is on and set up to about uh, half volume, it is absolutely dead silent. Also, the guitar we'll be using today is the same uh, Fender uh, 1963 Telecaster that uh, we used uh, for the Marshall demonstration. So uh, the little 8-inch speaker here ought to get plenty of nice clear input. Okay, so let's get started. that's about it for this video on the 1950 Magnetone Varsity Model M197-V3. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it's not a Marshall uh, or a Fender Baseman, but uh, I love it all the same and I hope you do too. I'd like to think we both learned something uh, from this video about a good way to clean Tolex cabinets and also to always double check uh, the bias of your output tube or tubes. As usual, I want to thank my generous uh, Patreon patrons and uh, PayPal contributors uh, for keeping us on the air and advertising free. Without you guys, uh, this would never happen. Okay, if any of you would like to join them, uh, please see the links in the video description. And uh, now, before we bid farewell, uh, let's take a quick trip to a recent car show that occurred here in town and see some cars that we've probably never seen before. Hope you enjoy it, and I hope you'll join us again soon on our next video. Well, it's 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Uh, we're going to head up to a big car show and party at a air museum uh, just a few miles from where I live. So I hope you'll join me for the trip, and I think you'll find it very interesting. Well, we've arrived at the airfield, which is an active one. All sorts of planes. 
it's a museum actually for old fighter aircraft and now we're having a car show in the middle of it here we are okay let's start our cavalcade of hot rods with this 32 Ford three window coupe it's all steel I know because the guys advertising it on Craigslist I've never seen the car before he advertised it like yesterday and here it is at the car show probably to catch the interest of people who like old cars he's at the right place you know I don't care for the spoked wheels uh, it looks like you know they're Kelsey Hayes style wheels from a much later model car uh, if you're gonna do spoked wheels you probably ought to stick with model B these almost look like Jaguar wheels but uh, beautiful car I think he wants like forty five or fifty thousand dollars for this jewel may get it probably not here here right next to it is a super nice very traditional style hot rod with the steel wheels beauty rings and uh, little Ford baby moons big white walls gorgeous body I love the interior perfect color choice I think very understated it's one of those gauges where there's four gauges in one makes the dash nice and neat unencumbered uncluttered I guess I should say look at this beautiful it costs about five times as much to build a flathead like this as it does to build a more modern engine you end up with less horsepower too but if you're a dedicated purist that's kind of the way you do it and boy did he beautiful job spectacular car here's one that comes to every one of these car shows and it's one of those deals like if you ever made an AMT model kit and you use too many parts and it just looked kind of cluttered and messy well like I mean that key back there come on kind of silly nice uh, chrome reverse wheels nice paint job great body I don't really care for the color choice I'm inflicting my opinion on y'all but it's the only opinion I've got okay gorgeous dash air conditioning look at that steering wheel looks like something out of a Lamborghini beautiful touches on this car obviously air conditioned big high rise with two Hollies it looks like gorgeous a lot of good points on this car a few things I'd change but uh, that's why they put knobs on television sets Here's a nice straight as an arrow two door hardtop 56 Chevy the American five spokes 350 nothing earth shaking here but get the old Texas 56 plate it's a replacement plate <clears throat> when you they are normally black and white and if your plate gets stolen like if you parked in Mexico for 30 seconds uh, they'd give you a replacement plate that was yellow we used to go over to Mexico so they'd steal our plates and then uh, we'd get these and then the girls would think we're from California the things you do when you're young huh? and I admit it here that's what really is pathetic you know there's an old saying that unless your body work is perfect don't paint it black okay and in this case looks like it is and he did a little tiny bit wavy there at the rear black will show the tiniest flaws in bodywork okay here we are at the front and you can see the grill and bumper everything is absolutely first class I'll tell you these old trucks had hard lives and to put one back in this kind of shape look at the dash gorgeous to do this is a almost superhuman task you know and then look at the bed brought a tent with him it looks like look at the wood absolutely gorgeous 
This car belongs to a friend of mine. He's, I would say, the best hot rod builder in, God, like a 500-mile radius. Uh, this is his latest creation. The little tiny moon tank is an overflow tank for the radiator. And the funny thing about these tanks, the smaller they are, the more expensive they are. Very strange. Look at those salt flat wheels polished with the, the knockoffs cost about $200 a piece or so. They're horrendously expensive. He wanted to get a little color contrast on the engine. He sure did. Isn't that gorgeous? And the transparent valve covers. First set gave him trouble. They had some cracks because he cut, you know, cut them and put breathers in them. And on this set, uh, he avoided that. And these are holding up real well. So all fiberglass body, but a real first class one. And look in here, he's got almost like lawn chairs, but it gives you sort of a suspension. It's like you're sitting on a trampoline. Okay, then uh, for the drink holders down there, and he likes manual transmission, so this one uh, is a six-speed. He shifts it himself, and it hauls ass, I'll tell you. It's a 327, but it's a tricky one. And aluminum heads, this the best of everything. Like I said, he's a master builder. Tire and wheel combination costs more than most people's cars. It's a beaut. Look at that little ventilated rear window on the convertible top. Like I said, all sorts of neat touches that he puts into cars. Stuff we haven't even thought of yet. Very inventive. Okay, let's take a look at this jewel. Beautiful pinstripe. Nice color. Sort of a tomato red, not fire engine red. Gorgeous wheels. I think this is a kit car. Uh, it's a fiberglass. I don't know. They, they have them. They're like Street Beasts. And there's other brands. Uh, but this thing has a complete tubular frame underneath. So it's sort of like a road racing car disguised as a 33 or 34 Ford. And these things really handle, I guess. It's just beautiful. So you have the looks of the antique, but the handling of a modern sports car. Very, very nicely done.